Good morning, everybody, everybody online and in the church. As we all know, I think there is so much to be learned about Francis of Assisi. I give retreats where there are eight sessions and you feel like you could still learn a lot more. But I think one thing we all know, I think one thing that people know about Francis is how he fell in love with creation, how he could see the beauty of creation and every created thing. And Rachel referred to the flyers and the swimmers. I brought with me, I'd like to share with you two things that are very, very simple, but are extremely beautiful. I have a bird's nest here and the nest of bees. What I want to do is, I'm sorry I can't do this online, but I'd like to pass pass this around and look at it. I would say st stare at it, not just look at it. Stare at it for en enough seconds that you can feel the beauty and the workmanship of these creatures. So I'm going to pass it this side for the nest, and I'll pass that side. Dave, you could put up the painting of Francis. This is my favorite portrait of Francis. And it happens that it actually, which is quite uh, beautiful, it, it was painted while he was still alive. It was painted in a, in a Benedictine monastery, and you can see on the top right at the beginning of Francisco Francis of his brother Francis, Frate. That's at the time how they knew him. Francis was born in, in 1182 in Assisi. And his father is Pietro Bernardone, who was a very, very wealthy cloth merchant. And some say he was the most wealthy in Assisi. His mother was Donna Pica de Bourlemont, a French woman. And Pietro probably met her in France because he spent a lot of time going to France and Spain to the cloth to the cloth festivals and it was a major if you can imagine going from Italy all the way to France and Spain to obtain cloth to sell in his shop in Assisi Francis mother was what we know about her she was strong gentle and loving Pietro Benedetti looked forward to the day when Francis would put his mind to the business of buying and selling cloth. For a time, Francis did take his place in the shop to such a degree that his father was very, very pleased. While a future in the family trade was assured to him, Francis longed to earn the title of knight. In 12, I'm going to skip a lot of years. In 1202, at the age of 20, Francis joins the war between Assisi and the neighboring town of Perugia. The two towns were separated by only a valley. At the bottom of the valley, there was a piece of land that they both wanted to possess. Thomas of Chilano, who was Francis' first biographer, wrote, There was a great massacre in a war between the citizens of Perugia and Assisi. The Perugians sent the blood-soaked Assisians fleeing for hiding places in the woods and in caves, then hunted them down like animals. The battlefield was covered with severed limbs, entrails, and mutilated heads. 
Francis would likely have taken part in the gut-churning cavalry charge to open the battle. The terror that the young combatant felt in his first cavalry charge cannot be underestimated. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is generally more traumatic than warfare fought from a distance, especially during retreats when most of the killing is done as pursuers pick off soldiers from behind. And if we're going to understand Francis' transition from warrior to peacemaker, we must consider the uncomfortable notion that Francis killed men in war during his time in, as a war maker. No one can say for sure if Francis killed, but it's likely that he did. His eventual decision to begin a life of penance hints that he believed he had sinned seriously on the battlefield. As a pris prisoner of war, Francis and his fellow Assisians, after being hauled up the mountain and marched through Perugia's city center, presumably before a taunting mob, were dumped in an underground vault. Prisoners taken in such vendetta-driven intercity warfare were tortured and humiliated to induce wealthy relatives to pay ransom. Many were chained to walls, languishing in near darkness, forced to live in the stench of their own filth, Many died of disease. Imagine living like that for a week, or imagine living like that for a month. Francis was a prisoner of war for a whole year in those kinds of conditions. I have spent some time in prison for war resistance, but never in such situations. Negotiations between Perugia and Assisi ransomed Francis and his fellow captives a year later. He, felt he left captivity a shattered young man. He had fallen ill in prison, probably of malaria, and as a result would have suffered from fever, chills, possible blood and liver disorders, and a general, generally speaking, a great weakness. He would suffer with malaria periodically for the rest of his life. Beyond his physical ailments, Francis was inevitably shadowed by psychological disturbance. No lights brightened the subterranean cell where he was held. Little, if any sunlight, would have reached him. In addition, Francis would inevitably have felt abandoned as time passed. Francis was released from prison sick, lost, and depressed, mentally ill. Today, we would say he suffered from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. A few years ago, an interviewer asked the young U.S. military drone operator, Brandon Bryant, you were diagnosed with PTSD, weren't you? Brandon replied, I wouldn't say it's a disorder. It's a perfectly reasonable human response to doing something like this. And like this was sitting watching a screen for 12 hours, waiting for an order to kill, what could be a pregnant woman or an old man or a child, only dots on a screen. It's probably the most cowardly form of welfare. Each drone strike creates more hatred, and more anger, and more terrorists. Regarding PTHD, I don't know how, how many... Do you know how many young men were killed in the Vietnam War, roughly? Does anybody know roughly? 
million, well, 50,000, 50,000. But what's probably more telling about warfare and the and war and the killing of, and the hatred of each other is that 50,000, the same number, 50,000 committed suicide. 50,000 young men committed suicide during the Vietnamese war. You can suffer from post-traumatic stress, but it's not necessarily a disorder. I would call what I went through in my bout of depression, I call it PTSW, post-traumatic stress wounding. It became part of my spiritual journey. The other patients in the hospital were my brothers and sisters. So can all our woundings become part of our spiritual journeys. For the rest of his life, Francis would seek solitude in the surrounding forest to pray intensely. Prayer and the sheer beauty of the countryside helped him to overcome the deep depression and mental illness that stole away his inherent joie de vivre. Once, on a day of my release from prison, I remember going to the park near my apartment. I lay down in, on the grass, and the constant noises of prison were gone, the noises of moans, cries, and curses. I could hear the exquisite songs of birds, and suddenly it struck me why Francis loved the sound of birds so much, why he loved birds so much. He had spent a year in a terror, terrific kind of prison. And also Brother Sun, Brother Sun, after being in prison in a dark dungeon for a whole year. Amazingly, just two years later, at age 23, Francis is again seduced by the very idea of a glorious war that was so pervasive in that culture, the whole idea of a glorious war. And we'll see a little later the whole notion that if you can try to imagine this was a holy war. I mean, the war on the part of the Israeli military is a holy war. The war on the part of Hamas is a holy war, more than just just war. And at the time of Francis, the wars were, in fact, by the church itself. So it was, you could say, especially holy wars. Francis' father, Pietro, dreams of the war's glory, of Francis entering the ranks of the nobility. Just imagine, sir, Francis. Francis does join the army, but he's being disturbed by Christ, a voice the very first night basically asks him, what are you doing? Who do you want to serve? Deeply disturbed by this voice, Francis returns to Assisi the very next day amidst taunts of desertion and cowardice and the disgrace of his father. He tries to lead a normal life, tries to sell cloth with his father, tries to play the king of songs for his friends. That was a nickname he had, the king of songs, because he was so merry and, and would sing with his friends in the streets and, and court the young women and so forth but he is experiencing profound spiritual longing and agitation. He frequents the forests and the caves. Slowly, he discovers inner strength from prayer and from the sheer beauty of the countryside, the sun, the birds, the animals, and all the natural elements. He speaks to them all, especially the birds, as mutual spiritual beings who are worthy of being addressed. Francis slowly develops a relationship with what he calls Lady Poverty. One of Francis' nicknames is Il Poverello, 
the little poor one. But that's been, you might have experienced it yourself, that's been romanticized. Oh yeah, Francis, the poor little one. It's extremely important, I hope you would agree, to go beyond a romantic notion of poverty. Literal poverty is an ugly, destructive violence versus Francis' liberating renunciation of extreme wealth and privilege and power over others. Francis' spiritual instinct regarding living simply goes far, far beyond a romantic individualistic piety. It's a mystical, prophetic, and universal instinct. Humanity urgently needs to embrace living simply in order to have a future and to pass on a future to its children and to develop a relationship with abused Mother Earth. Francis lived and taught the principle of dispossession, not living without things, but without possessing things. In our culture, that can express in things like in a lot of ways it can express itself, can it? But it can also express itself in things like car sharing, tool rentals, housing cooperatives, credit unions. Credit unions don't invest in mega wealth that comes from investing in mega banks that invest in war and abuse of Mother Earth. One day, the Bishop of Assisi says to Francis, your life seems hard to me. It must be burdensome not to have any earthly possessions. Francis gives this stunning response. If we wanted to possess anything, then we would also need arms to defend ourselves. That is how all the quarrels and conflicts get started. And they are obstacles to love. For this reason, we wish to possess nothing. I don't know if you noticed, but he does not say we should resist war, we should not participate in war because it destroys things, not even because it, not primarily or not first of all, because it kills people, but because it is an obstacle to love. You know, in the gospel reading, Jesus says, I give you my peace. I do not, I do not give peace the way the world gives peace. I do not give peace the way the world gives peace. That's what Francis discovered that there is true peace that is beyond warfare. Francis' words resonate through the centuries. If we wanted to possess anything, then we'd also need arms to defend ourselves. Arms were then, in Francis' time, and are today extremely expensive. The entire body of work of the United Nations, including peacekeeping, and the sweeping social and economic operation of 40 specialized agencies and programs costs $30 billion a year for the programs of the United, United Nations. That's a lot of money. That's also less than 2% of what the nations of the world spend on armaments. Less than 2% of what the world spends on armaments. As you might guess, I'm, by the way, I'm reading from, I just wrote a book on Francis and sent to the publishers, and so I'm reading my notes, otherwise I get really carried away and so I'm trying to be strict. 
But I want I really do want to share this part where Francis encounters the leper. Francis had always been had always given freely to beggars, but not to lepers. He was too terrified of lepers. But one day there's a leper in his path. At first he turns around, but something powerful is happening deep, deep in his soul. He comes back and embraces the leper. And you can imagine, if you can and imagine in your life, what lepers can look like, disfigured. And so Francis was drawn by God. Later, he writes of this astonishing foundational turning point in his conversion. He writes, while I was in sin, it seemed very bitter to me to see lepers. But it was God who led me among them. When I left them, that which seemed bitter to me was changed into sweetness of soul and body. Afterward, I lingered a little, but it did not take me long to leave the world. Leave what world? What was he referring to? Referring to the world of excessive wealth, the world of power over others, especially women, the poor, and sister Mother Earth, the world of holy wars and their just wars teaching, the world of empires, both state and church. I would like to end with reading the Canticle of Creation. He referred to it as the Canticle of Brother's Son. What's interesting about this uh, what you would call it, a poem, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, he, he was written in 1224, just two years before he died. He was very ill. He was almost blind. And, and yet he was so taken by the beauty of God's creation that he could write this thing. The other thing that's interesting about it that you should know is that it was written not in church Latin, like most things were written at the time, but in the but in the new language of Italian. So that was very, very exciting for people. It was very, very exciting to hear it in their in their language. And I'll read a little bit of the Italian. And I was told that my Italian is very good, so so you can uh, take it for what it is. So here is the canticle of creation. Altissimo, omnipotente, bon signore, tu es edo laude, la gloria, l'onore, et omni benedictione. A te solo, altissimo, se confano, et nulo, homo, en indigno te mentovare. God most high, all powerful and good, to you all praise and glory, honor and blessing. No one is worthy to breathe your name. Be praised, my God, through all your creation. In the first place, for blessed brother's son, who brings us the day and through whom you give us light, who is beautiful and radiant with great splendor, giving witness of you full of power. Be praised, my God, for sister moon and the stars, formed by you so bright, precious, and beautiful. Be praised, my God, for brother wind and the air, the stormy and fair skies, for every weather. Be praised, for it is life-giving. Be praised, my God, for sister water, so useful, humble, precious, and pure. Be praised, my God, for brother fire, who lights up the night. He is beautiful and happy, powerful and vigorous. Be praised, my God, for our sister Mother Earth, who nourishes and guides us while bringing forth abundance of fruits, colored flowers, and herbs. 
Be praised, my God, for those who forgive through your love and bear sickness and trial. Blessed are those who keep themselves in peace, for they shall be rewarded by you, Most High. Be praised, my God, for our sister bodily death, whom no living person can escape. Praise and bless God. Give thanks. Serve God with great humility. Amen.